Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm James Lockyer. I work for Microsoft. I sit within our environmental sustainability team. Um, our team is split between uh, procurement and our climate innovation fund. And, and I sit within the, the climate innovation fund half of the team, uh, where we're responsible for deploying around $1 billion worth of capital over the next few years. Um, made about 55 investments to date. Um, across areas like carbon capture um, and many others uh, that were touched on earlier. Uh, thanks, thanks again for being here today. All right, I'm also called James. I'm James Hunt. I'm with uh, Baker Hughes. We're an energy technology company. Globally, we partner with Microsoft, TCS and others. And I'm here to talk to you today um, over the next few minutes on various technologies um, very relevant to the keynote that we just had. So I'll pick up on some of those aspects. Um, I, my focus is in the sustainability organisation on technologies like hydrogen and carbon capture. So I look forward to sharing that with you. Good to see you. Thank you. And I'm not called James. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm uh, Mercedes uh, Maroto Valid and I have a, a couple of uh, roles and I hope I will be able to unpack that um, through the next few minutes. So on one hand, I'm um, the Deputy Principal for Global Sustainability at Harriet Watt University, so looking after everything that has to do with sustainability from carbon literacy to actually getting a net zero across our campus locations in Scotland, Malaysia and Dubai. And then the other thing I hope to share with you as well is around um, my other role, um, leading a UK centre on industrial decarbonisation. So we work with the largest clusters in the UK and um, that they contribute to 50% of the carbon emissions. And the centre is called IDRIC, Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, and the ethos of the centre is really aligned with many of the things we heard this morning around bringing the ecosystems together, new approaches to innovation, a collaboration that is going to be key. So I hope I will be able to unpack that um, over the next few minutes. Thank you. And many thanks for inviting me, of course. Thank you and good morning, everybody. My name is Muzzy Dora Jurgensen. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for Microsoft in the UK. Everybody knows me as Muzzy, though, so uh, please do call me Muzzy. So work closely with James. I guess my role is looking at how we bring sustainability through uh, a UK lens and working very closely with a lot of our customers and our partners, as well as thinking about the efficiencies that we need to be driving uh, as Microsoft UK. So. Uh, a lot of that, again, is focusing on how we can help drive those sustainable outcomes that we so desperately need to see in the world and uh, working closely into our environmental sustainability team, who uh, is led by our global sustainability officer, Melanie. So uh, lots of things I hope I can share in terms of what Microsoft does um, from our journey ourselves. Thank you. Most of you know me. I'm Swati from Tata Consultancy Services. I head the sustainability practice globally for uh, TCS. I've been working with our hyperscaler partners, especially Microsoft, very closely and strategically to help our customers cutting across different ecosystems, starting from uh, power and utilities, oil and gas, manufacturing, retail, to uh, sort of accelerate their journey in uh, their uh, net zero goals and also the larger ESG governance uh, you know, challenges that they have. Looking forward to have a very interactive session today and I would uh, also be moderating the panel today. So I think uh, I will uh, now start with uh, 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 Mercedes for a very, very important opening uh, question on uh, the pioneering work that you're doing in Industrial Decarbonization Research and Innovation Center. I know it's a very challenging work and uh, we would love to hear about uh, the work uh, that you're doing and also uh, the work that you're doing as a Deputy Principal in Heritage Watt University. We are fortunate uh, to be associated with you and looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Um, so I, I think probably what I want to do is just give some sort of headlights at this point and then I guess we can just go into more detail through, through the rest of the panel. Um, so if I can start maybe with the, the second one, the, the role of Deputy Principal. Um, so one of the things that uh, we are looking here is about the global sustainability that cuts, cuts across countries with very, very different approaches to sustainability and very different journeys in terms of the, the net zero transition. So I think that's something we are very keen that this is not, going on, not only going to be our campuses in Scotland, but it's going to be a global operation that we have in Malaysia and Dubai. 
And one of the areas that we are quite keen is actually to which extent, as a university, as a provider of higher education, we really can start changing behaviours, because that's really going to be very important. I mean, we talk about technology, and clearly we do need to have the technologies, but behaviours are actually driving whether those technologies are really implemented, and also even our own carbon footprint is going to be driven by our own behaviours. So one of the, the areas that we are quite excited is really how can we really, again, with our role as educators, have a carbon literate alumni, carbon literate students, carbon literate staff. Because we do believe that through that process of education you are actually going to be taking informed decisions. And that's really what we need. I think we need to be people to understand all together that we need to be in this journey to get net zero. So we are quite keen in getting um, carbon literacy programs uh, running across all our campus locations. We also are developing a plan as well uh, to become net zero and I think as, as it has been said already, uh, net zero is not just about declaring a goal, it's really making sure that you have the trajectory and the path to get there. And that's not going to be an easy path, I think we need to be clear on that as well. But unless you have plot that, pa that path, you're not going to be able really to measure progress that you are doing. So I think it's really important and we do see unfortunately a number of institutions, not only just in higher education, that they have made uh, these statements of net zero, but it's not much underneath, to be honest. Um, and, and I think you can see that um, across a number of really big corporates as well, to some extent, that they do not really know. Um, so IDRIC was set up by the UK government back in uh, 2019. Uh, it's part of the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge, so all that is a package of uh, half a billion pounds, um, much half between the government and half through private investment. And that programme has three elements. It has an element of uh, infrastructure, deployment projects. It has an element of uh, net zero roadmaps, or cluster plans as we call them. And then it has a third element that is the research and innovation centre. And, and that's the one that I'm director and champion. So what we're doing is we are underpinning the research and innovation, so the seven largest clusters in the UK transition to net zero. And there are two characteristics I want to mention here, and then I'll pass it to, to my colleagues. Um, there are two really defining features. Uh, one of them is around a whole systems approach. So I think it resonates already with what we heard this morning. Um, we do need the technologies that, that James already mentioned, uh, but we also need to have the business models. Uh, we need to have the regulatory, the, the planning that is actually key at this stage for many of these large projects to get going. Things like planning and permitting, we should not forget. And then with all that, that we haven't mentioned so far, is the skills. And again, that's where the role of higher education is going to be quite critical. But I did say there are two defining characteristics. One of them is the whole systems, and the second one, and I will wrap up with this, um, the second one is around the ecosystems. Um, if you really want to accelerate the path, uh, you need to have the whole research and innovation ecosystem together. You need to make sure from day one you have industry-led challenges, that you put the best researchers with the best ideas, and then you have a pathway to translate that into impact and commercialization. And that's the other element that we do in IDRIC. So I'm going to stop here, but I'm quite happy to follow up afterwards as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. I think that has been quite insightful. In fact, what we have been seeing is, uh, while 90% of uh, the executives heading uh, big companies acknowledge that sustainability is important, only 60% are able to put a very robust sustainability strategy. And I think you addressed a very important gap there uh, where it's important uh, to collaborate between research, innovation, and the industry. And it all should come together to address uh, the evolving uh, business models that are viable in the long run. Thank you so much for that uh, insight. I uh, would next go to uh, Musi. Uh, thanks, Musi, again for uh, coming. Uh, we know that we have a responsibility as uh, hyperscalers and technology service providers in the digital space. How do you think uh, uh, the digital innovations uh, can address the concerns that companies have in terms of traceability especially? Uh, I'll just uh, give you a small example. We were talking to a pharma and healthcare company recently and uh, the procurement uh, officer said that uh, while uh, we uh, see suppliers saying that uh, the palm oil that they're supplying to us is RSPO certified, Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil certified, 
we know for a fact that the country of origin that they are sourcing from is perhaps deforestation prone. So do you think it's important to have real-time traceability when it comes to wildlife uh, checking on biodiversity impacts and uh, obviously uh, the deforestation impacts because deforestation is one of the most important uh, cause of global warming. Would love to hear from you. Thank you. And look, I think you've just given a brilliant example of how complex sustainability is. It's not just one thing. There's no one silver bullet. It's global systemic change, as you said, that we need to address. I think there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's one very important underpinning foundation that, that we really need to be um, looking at here, which obviously Microsoft is, is heavily invested in, in, in focusing on for our customers and partners. And that's unifying all of the data that we have across our organizations and across the world and the planet to be able to make better decisions in terms of how we go and either reduce our impact or protect the um, ecosystems and the biodiversity that we have. And I get a unique position, I guess, in the role that I do here at Microsoft <coughs> in that I get to spend a lot of times, uh, a lot of time with our uh, customers and the uh, sustainability leads within our customers in the UK. Um, we did a, a review last year that showed that two-thirds of UK businesses across all sectors and all sizes don't have a plan yet. So absolutely back up the point that you say is that we are at a critical point now where we have to take action. I mean, we've got just over six years uh, to ensure that we are within this 1.5 degree and all the science backs that up. And so when I'm out with customers, a lot of the... Um, the, the complexities around un unravelling through all of this. One absolutely sits with the skills gap, and I, we can talk more about that um, later insofar as how did we have the talent pipeline to help with a lot of these um, areas, particularly green skills, blue skills, but those transformation, uh, you know, those, those skills that need to sit across uh, the business as well to translate some of the, the, those, those skills too. But the other area is how to unravel through all of the data. And so when you are tasked as a, an organisation to, to do that and report on it and, and it to be auditable and we know with EMEA, uh, EMEA regulation coming down the European that that is absolutely critical as of, of next year for um, UK businesses, that's really difficult because a lot of that data will be sat in spreadsheets, it will be in siloed um, disparate systems across the organisation and it's really hard when uh, you know, you go and then ask your suppliers to, to tell you what um, their impact is as well to bring all of that together. So, as I say, Microsoft has, has built the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability, which is really looking at it at the common data model for um, all of these challenges that, that customers have so that we're all on the same page, we're all defining it and measuring it in the same way that can help us see where we need to get to. And the other thing I would say back to the, the nature piece is we know with the rising climate is a detrimental impact that that has on biodiversity and the ecosystems across the world. And so Microsoft have put a big uh, focus again into how we can build data and that, that data um, view for what's happening and so therefore make better decisions. So we're building uh, something called Planetary Computer and I would urge you all if you haven't heard of it to go and, and look at it. You can see there's amazing data sets that uh, are in there already which exist around the data for what's happening across the world in many different aspects um, which then means that if we've all got access to this and it's, it's an open source data platform then we can all look at how we can apply those uh, data sets to the use cases that we have that ultimately mean that we can make better decisions but I would say uh, you know underpinning it all is, is having a proper unified view of your data that means that you can then uh, ensure that you can uh, make the decisions you need to to protect it. Absolutely, Masi. I think uh, we have seen a study which says that uh, more than 70% of uh, the next-gen UK consumers would like to pay a premium for uh, sustainability. And I think you are creating foundation, uh, a data foundation for that because they're going to demand for uh, traceable, uh, auditable data if they're going to pay a premium for it, obviously. And I think uh, that's very insightful. Um, I would next go to James Hunt. Uh, your uh, passion for sustainability is uh, infectious. I've told you about this. Uh, you've, uh, in fact, chosen to work on sustainability. You had a very lucrative sales career. But I think uh, it's important for uh, people from uh, background, background like yours to come and uh, work on sustainability. I have a tough question for you today. 
Uh, we keep hearing about uh, the marginal abatement cost curve for uh, decarbonization technologies. There's a range of technology uh, that's available today. We are not sure if they are, uh, uh, you know, that way technologically ready. Uh, we know that uh, your organization is working on uh, the new frontier uh, technology innovations. There are also uh, speculations around uh, what can be a viable technology in the long run. Uh, should you go with a technically robust technology or something which can quickly cut carb, uh, carbon, uh, even, even if it's not technically proven 100%. What is your view on uh, companies, uh, especially the carbon heavy uh, industries who would like to adopt these technologies in the long run? How do you see the, uh, you know, the financial curve evolving for them in the future? Uh, some, some insights from your experience, sales experience as well, will be very, very useful. All right, thank you. It's a really relevant question, and, and I am passionate about this. Hopefully, I'll impress upon that um, in the next few minutes. The, there's three areas that I want to talk about, and I have a, I'll start by saying I have a bit of a hard time with some words, some, some buzzwords, which often, well, either we don't understand the impact or they don't have tangible action. And I'm going to start off with a buzzword, but actually explain from my perspective the importance of it, and it's actually efficiency. I'll then go on to talk about carbon capture, utilization, storage and hydrogen. But efficiency, so I work in the energy industry, and if we look at oil and gas operations alone, I'm going to throw some numbers at you here. If we were to be 10% more efficient today on the current oil and gas operations, that would contribute to a saving of 500 million tonnes of CO2 per year. Okay? I can't visualise what that looks like, but to put it in perspective, if we look at the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement with the emissions reductions, that's 5% of the CO2. So 10% just on efficiency. I say just like it's a trivial task. It's not always easy. But just on efficiency gains, we can yield a huge saving on emissions. Now that might be from operating something differently or by a new technology. To further that point, if we look at a lot of power generation, and in this example, gas turbines, if we were to increase the efficiency of a gas turbine by 1%. That's going to give 2.5% 2 2 savings on the CO2. So efficiency gains are significant. Okay. I think, Muzzy, you mentioned there's no silver bullet technology. And that's right. There's no single solution, no single company that can do this. And in fact, I often say no one company or individual has the monopoly of technology or the monopoly of good ideas. Just to strengthen or add credence to the comment that we have to do this together. But there are some really promising technologies that exist to address the current emissive, hard to abate sectors, think oil and gas, mining, steel, cement, that are gonna to continue to be needed in the short and medium term energy mix. And then there's some fuels of the future. And those technologies today, or to address the issues today, carbon capture, utilization, storage, or CCUS, okay? So carbon capture can be done in many ways, okay? Not always commercially viable at scale, but it could be in the pre-combustion phase, post-combustion, or a technology that I'm really excited about is what we call DAC, direct air capture. This is where we remove carbon from the atmosphere. So it's not necessarily associated to an industrial process. Those technologies are continuing to evolve. They need to, and we need to to Sri's point earlier, we need to address the, the IRRs, the hurdle rates, and get them commercially available at scale. But technologies like direct air capture, this is a really exciting space. It's not early concept. It's, if, if you look at how we develop technology, we have a technology maturation curve. And on day one, that might be at what we call TRL1, technology readiness level one. The basic principles have, have been observed, back of an envelope concept. We advance that and eventually we'll get to TRL 9, technology, technology Readiness Level 9. That's where it's commercially available at scale. Now that's not a linear process, nor is every step guaranteed. And to the, up, to the graphic we saw on screen earlier, sometimes these ideas fall off. But we have to keep on innovating and investing because that maturation curve, when we've got the technology proven at scale and it's commercially viable, that's when we really have game-changing technology. If you look 20 or 30 years ago, solar and wind probably had a similar level of scepticism as CCUS does today for some, for some people. 
but those cost curves have dramatically come down. And it's actually encouraging to see our colleagues across the pond in the US, government incentives like the Inflation Reduction Act, more government research dollars and spend for R&D is required, but these incentives to make these investments in these new frontier technologies like CCUS at scale are really required. So that's kind of looking at technologies that will address today's issues and the future issues. But really at Baker Hughes, you know, I get to see some pretty cool stuff of innovation in the fuels of the future. And I'm going to talk about hydrogen because obviously hydrogen, the, it's, it's often spoken about, not understood, how do we get it? It rarely exists in its own form. It's attached to something else, whether it's oxygen in water or hydrocarbon, losing the question, it's attached to carbon. So we need to separate it. We need to go through a process to actually produce the, the hydrogen. That's not cheap. It's not low energy. It's not always sustainable. So when you think about the energy trilemma, where we need energy that's secure, affordable, and sustainable, that really is the case with hydrogen as well. But there's a lot of promising technology involved in producing hydrogen. Electrolyzer technology. Now the cost curves don't make sense today, but like many things 20 or 30 years ago, that investment, that continuous R&D to get it along the technology maturation curve, we need to do that because if we get hydrogen right, if we can produce hydrogen and have a sustainable transportation and the, and the proper utilization of it at the back end, that's going to be really, really game changing. So electrolyzer technology, while addressing all the other issues around it, whether it's scarcity of water or the actual power requirements to power that electrolyzer, I think those are some technology innovations we can be excited about, but be mindful that we need the incentives to get there. And we need to recognize that today the technologies might exist, but they're not going to be at scale or financially viable. Uh, I think uh, digital levers can play a major role and technology plays a major role again and uh, it's important to bring the physical and digital aspects together and uh, we, we would love to hear from you uh, your vision uh, for uh, leveraging digital levers uh, for net zero. Thank you Swati and it's a great question and I think one of the, the I think the key observations over the over the last few years has been the really the, I guess, um, advent, adoption, and now scaling of digital twin um, AI and IoT technologies. Um, what we're really seeing is a, is a transformation in the way that businesses are, are, are adopting uh, digital solutions in that space to help model the physical world, um, and then really look at what changes they make in that digital environment um, will impact on the phys uh, physical world. And so I think what gets really interesting there is that you can start to play around with the models and start to, to start to ascertain where are you going to get efficiencies in your operation, where will you see impact across multiple different industries, and I think um, a couple of industry kind of perspectives would be that in the built environment we have certainly seen um, some incredible advancements in areas like um, digital twin of buildings to help improve things like um, operational efficiencies around HVAC systems, so heating, ventilation. Um, and air conditioning, but also in areas like building management systems, but then how you overlay that with data like um, occupancy, and then thinking about how oc occupancy can drive things like power uses of lighting and, and, and air conditioning in certain rooms. Um, and that has an incredible knock-on effect then on energy usage. And so we're seeing um, typically energy reduction um, of around 25% in, um, in, in the projects that we've worked on. Um, but I think with the newer technologies coming to market as well, we're seeing that going up to 40, 50 percent, which is really exciting in this space. So the, the digital innovation is just, is just really um, compelling. And I think if we look at another industry like um, probably manufacturing, when we look at the um, overall equipment efficiency gains of manufacturing equipment in, let's say, pharma or in, or in uh, kind of heavy industry, again, we're seeing those efficiency improvements through modeling and digital twins which are getting you to in the region of 15, 20% of, um, of efficiency. So again, those energy savings are, are um, incredibly valuable when it comes to your own sustainability goals. Um, but in addition to that, and particularly in, in the current climate, that also has a knock-on effect around uh, reducing costs as well, uh, which is huge. And, and I think, if anything, a personal frustration is 
um, we need to see more widespread adoption of those technologies because they are having significant impact. Um, it's just that it feels like um, we just haven't got the traction yet that we need, but yet the, the, the capability is there. So I think that's something that, that I, I, you know, I would challenge everyone in the room to think about is, well, how is my business adopting these technologies? Uh, and if not, it's time to start looking at that um, because they will play a big role in terms of um, helping to meet uh, the 2030 goals and, and individual company um, sustainability goals. Um, I think one other reflection, um, just hearing the, the rest of the panelists talk today, is my, I really love the, the, the conversation around um, carbon capture and storage and particularly um, direct air capture. I think as part of the, the Climate Innovation Fund, um, again, we see such incredible digital innovation there. Um, and we've made a few investments in, in um, direct air cap capture companies like uh, Climeworks, who are providing us or helping us to, to reach kind of high quality carbon credits. And of course, there is a, an industrial process behind that as well. And so again, you think about the adoption of digital capabilities to help um, streamline performance there and help improve efficiencies. Um, which will hopefully in the future um, help to in increase efficiencies around um, you know, amount of CO2 um, stored in, in basalt rock, for example. Um, so I hope that helps us a couple of perspectives. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, just to add to that, uh, so what we see when we work with customers is there's some sort of a pain that we need to alleviate when it comes to helping them with digital solutions. They are at the moment, uh, I would say, swamped by a lot of options, and uh, we have the responsibility to help them prioritize, choose, because there is no one size fits all. And uh, we have done that as part of our consulting uh, experience. Uh, what we also do effectively is uh, we have to cross leverage the learnings from one sector into the other sector. Like, for, for example, we have seen how consumer goods companies in the food and agricultural space, especially, have created solutions which can be auditable fully auditable and traceable when it comes to measuring their end-to-end -end carbon emission. And we are, uh, uh, in fact, aspiring to replicate that for uh, different industries uh, beyond the consumer goods. It's, again, a big challenge, but uh, I think uh, our customers have been very kind to give us that opportunity to work with them and see if that's possible. Uh, we also form uh, uh, effectively strategic collaborations uh, which will help scale these solutions. Our uh, partnership with Microsoft is an evidence to this. And uh, we also work with uh, small and medium enterprises, smaller companies who are innovating in this space. They have to come together. We have a co-innovation uh, partnership which we work uh, on uh, constantly and that actually uh, helps bring in talent from all over the world uh, because this is so multidisciplinary and there are different geographies which are involved. So we want to bring talent from all over the world together as TCS. The third thing that we do, I think, uh, quite well is uh, bringing uh, together the next gen talent with uh, our customers, uh, connecting them with the customers. So we do this through an initiative called Sustainathon, which is very geography specific because we believe that uh, when it comes to understanding a challenge, uh, it's new gen uh, uh, talent in the geography that understands that very well. And they should also be passionate enough to get into a career which is uh, addressing these challenges for our customers. So we have the Sustainathon events which keep happening which helps uh, nurture new ideas, uh, which can, I believe, can come from uh, new gen, uh, the emerging uh, talent that we have in the market. My next question uh, would be uh, to Masi again, uh, as uh, the Chief Sustainability Officer of uh, TCS, uh, sorry, of uh, Microsoft UK, apologies. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, there are quite a few challenges you have uh, ahead of you uh, when it comes to understanding how a tech company can uh, help uh, you know uh, not only uh, scale uh, uh, digital innovations but also adopt it uh, in their own business model uh, so we would like to hear from you about cloud for sustainability uh, which is an innovation from microsoft uh, and anything that you would like to share to the rest of the tech counterparts like us uh, you know uh, who are uh, also aspiring to uh, you know come up with innovations around sustainability in the digital space Thank you, and um, I should probably j should start by saying that we at Microsoft look at sustainability through three sort of concentric circles. So at the centre of the, the circle is, is how we ensure that we uh, get our own house in order when it comes to the net zero challenge. So we've made four commitments across um, you know, carbon, water, waste uh, and ecosystems, as, I, as I've said. 
And the second uh, circle really is, uh, and I should say uh, the, the Microsoft uh, emissions represents 0.03% of the overall global emissions in the world. So if we just stop there, you know, th there's a whole 99.97% uh, left to do. So the, the, the second circle is really around what we can do to help using our technology to scale for some of the solutions um, for all of our customers uh, and partners that we work with across the world. And in some capacity, Microsoft has a relationship with you know, the, the most of the rest of the, that, those emissions that that represents. And so, as I said earlier, one of the things that we uh, focus on, uh, obviously ha with the huge heritage of innovation and um, you know, solving for complex solutions is what we can do to help with a lot of those complexities that our customers face. And as I said earlier, that's a lot to do with the data challenge that, that sits there. And so we've developed what's called the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability. And that is really the answer to, uh, as I said, building out the common data model that a lot of our customers uh, struggle with. And there's many sort of pillars that, that sit within the, the overall cloud. The one that um, is, is addressing the most immediate challenge that customers have is called our micro, the sustainability manager, which is how you manage and track your carbon accounting across all the three scopes that sit um, within an organisation. And in fact, tomorrow we've got a, an event um, that uh, we're happy to, to share the link with, which discusses with BBC, who are one of the first in the UK to adopt the sustainability manager who really talk about that complexity of trying to track and manage and look at what's happening across not only all of their uh, organisations, but what's happening with their suppliers as well, and how before they were working on the sustain Microsoft Sustainability Manager, that is, was all being done on spreadsheets or heavily leaning into uh, a, you know, huge expense to consultants and, and, and specialist SMEs to help build through uh, their report. And now they're able to, uh, with the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability, look at that through, the, through all the three scopes, right down to the level of the cost center that they need for all of the projects and the, and the um, uh, you know, programs that they run. Uh, so that gives them the insights then to be able to see what's happening, you know, where, where they can drive efficiencies, make better decisions then to, to ensure that they're on this, this, um, this track to hit their goals that they've set for 2030 and 2050. So that's one example, but um, we've also put in huge development into other areas like um, how you track and manage the carbon credits, uh, you know, for the, the, um, the, the thing that people, people are buying to ensure that that is actually delivering what it says it is and it's coming from a, a viable source. Uh, you know, new developments across what that means from water and waste, etc. So we really are looking to sol help our customers solve for, for these things, as well as, of course, use that ourselves uh, at Microsoft to, to do the things that we need to do. Thank you. I think uh, that uh, definitely covers the uh, important uh, digital uh, lever that uh, we were uh, struggling to understand in terms of uh, scaling up uh, all the decarbonization initiatives and how physical and digital can come together. We also uh, wanted to throw up on our last question today to all of you. Uh, so we had uh, uh, Srini mentioning about our guiding framework, the three by four by five framework, where uh, we are saying for an organization to be sustainable by design, they have to look at at least three uh, core uh, impact elements, which is uh, economic, environmental and social and four uh, aspects which are uh, uh, you know the driving core principles of sustainable by design this would be something like for example uh, a connected plant which is uh, fueled by renewables a connected uh, service uh, which is the extended supply chain of uh, the company which uh, needs to follow responsible business practices. We just heard how complex that can be because that's almost 80 to 90 percent of uh, emissions, especially when it comes to companies who are diversified and have a very complex uh, supply chain. This can be very challenging and that's the hardest uh, nut to crack for us when we consult with customers. We also have uh, intelligent products uh, that uh, we want customers to design and for which we say uh, these products have to be uh, uh, you know, re uh, using regenerative materials. Uh, they have to make sure that uh, everything that goes into them is uh, you know, in that, that, that sense regenerative in nature and addresses the circular economy principles. 
And last but not the least, we believe in a resilient uh, digital thread that connects all of this together, which is your plans, your services, and uh, your supply chain, and your products, and uh, which you which are selling to your customers. And this the the most integral part of this digital thread would be also consumer insights which are coming back to you as a feedback for the products and services that you're launching, because that is key to define the uh, future of uh, sustainable products and services. Uh, I would uh, now throw open uh, to our panel speakers first, your uh, views about uh, sustainable by design, the framework itself. Uh, what do you think are the core elements, design elements that have to go into something called sustainable by design? Uh, because this is something that many of our uh, uh, customers and uh, partners have been uh, debating and brainstorming around. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, Shridi keeps telling me that uh, we need to think very hard to see what uh, can uh, be applicable for a brownfield versus a greenfield company, for example. Well, all that can be true for a greenfield company may not be commercially viable for a brownfield company. So what do you think is sustainable by design and what uh, what that journey can look like for a typical uh, company, in your opinion, any any of you would like to answer. Thanks, Swati. I'm going to say another buzzword. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But I think we could have all the technology. Let's just imagine a world where all the technology exists. If we don't have the commercial frameworks to unlock that technology and encourage different companies, different industries to work together, I think it all falls apart. The buzzword here is collaboration. When I joined this company 17 years ago, I would work on offshore platforms in the North Sea. I would arrive, I'd do a job, I would leave. Our company would get paid for that, whether it was delivering some equipment or providing a service. Did I care about the bigger project at the time? Not really. Just like the analogy I use is when a plumber comes to your house to service your boiler, when he or she leaves, are they interested in the rest of your house? No. So. The trans it was very transactional when I joined the industry, where we were paid, we weren't really interested in the bigger goal, what's important for the customer's project. That's evolved, there has been an evolution of the contracting model, and maybe the last five or 10 years, I've been encouraged by a lot of more performance-based contracts, shared goals, shared objectives, let's do what's right for the project. But they're largely commercially driven, financial metrics. I think there's a further evolutionary step we need, and that's to have a carbon quotient if everybody does what's right for the project based on the sustainability of that project. I think that's where we can really unlock something powerful. I say about the buzzword collaboration, I work for a large matrix organization, many of you here will do as well, and we, by design, we create these artificial barriers in our organization, or silos, you might call it, right, where we're not really incentivized to work cross, cross company. So there's a challenge. Then when you try and work with another company or another industry and really collaborate, something drastic needs to change for us to really have that true collaboration. Swati mentioned a common goal. That's absolutely key. We cannot overshoot with a 1.5 degree target. Um, I'll pause for breath in one moment, but I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, my four and a half year old daughter here because I talk about my job at home. <laughs> My wife and I, we talk about what we do, and my four-year-old is really switched on. The brain is like a sponge. I didn't realize just how much she listened to what I'm talking about. I was pulled aside a couple of months ago by my, uh, my daughter's teacher at school saying, can I have a word? I thought, oh gosh, <laughs> what? And she said, we, we spent the day talking about what does mummy or daddy do? And my daughter's reaction was, daddy talks to people about making the planet a better place. And that kind of underpins the why. We talk about 1.5 degrees, we talk about net zero, but that's really the why. And we've got a duty to do this for future generations. And I'm really inspired by that. But it's only gonna happen if we have that collaboration and the commercial model and the technology and the supply chain and everybody working, again, not racing, but working together. And I think if you get that in your design, then I think we're onto something pretty exciting. Absolutely. Uh, there was a recent Gartner research which says that 91% uh, of investors, venture capitalists, are looking for ESG as a primary goal for investing. And that kind of gives the selling point for a greenfield company to be uh, you know, focusing on uh, sustainable by design. And again, we have a smaller number, but not a bad number, 85%, Gartner says, 
uh, of banks are monitoring ESG of their existing assets, which means the green, the brownfield uh, companies have, uh, uh, you know, have a inspiration to uh, be more uh, sustainable because uh, they are going to be benefited by the, uh, you know, obviously the green loans and subsidies that they are going to get uh, from uh, these uh, banks and financial institutions. And I think you you just covered that uh, this number should increase. Uh, you know, possibly we should look at a hundred percent. Uh, investment in only uh, businesses which uh, can uh, look at uh, sustainability as part of its core and also are sustainable by design. And I think we have obviously a common uh, sort of responsibility to come up with the framework for, to measure this in a very robust way. And uh, the the three by four by five framework which we presented is an attempt uh, to do this, and it'll be available with you all uh, very soon. Uh, I just wanted to uh, check with James Locke here because uh, I know you want to say something. <laughs> um, thank you, Swati. Yeah, I just wanted to actually share a statistic because um, when you think about sustainable by design, of course, you've got the product design phase um, right at the start of that, that, that journey. Um, and we participated in the CBI Net Zero event, which was last June, and sat on a couple of different um, uh, roundtable discussions. And one of those was, was with the UK Design Council. And they shared a pretty horrific statistic, which was that 80% of the environment, environmental impact of a product is caused at the design phase. Um, and so, you know, when you really unpick what that means, it means that sustainable by design really does include right at the inception of that product, how you approach building that, how you're sourcing the materials, um, and really thinking about the life cycle of that product all the way through. And I just thought 80% was scary. So I just thought I would land that point to kind of hopefully drive some, some uh, action there as well. Thank you. I agree, I agree. And that actually opens up more opportunities for someone like me who's consulting in this space as well. <laughs> so I hand over the mic to Mercedes yes. uh, for your thoughts. Yeah, just a quick thought, maybe something um, we need to, to reflect as well on a couple of points. I think is we've been mentioning the word scale a few times, and I think for me the other key word that comes is pace and scale. I think those are the two really key words we need because as much as it seems like we are kicking the ball in the long grass by saying 2050, um, if you really look at these targets, 2030 is the key one. We need to make sure by 2030, at least 45% of the global emissions uh, have come down. So we need to keep that and to reach that, 2030 target, we don't have many months left actually. But then going back in terms of the sustainability by design, um, I think what we need to, to think as well in that space is this is not only about new industries, uh, because it's relatively easier when you create something new. Uh, I think what it gets more complex is actually that we have quite a lot of assets, particularly for energy intensive industries, that have to be transitioned as well. Because uh, you know many of you in this room as well in terms of uh, that we don't have many investment cycles from now till 2030 to actually make the right decisions. So we need to make sure that A, we create new assets that are sustainable by design, but also that we use those core principles as we transition the existing assets. Uh, because it has to happen, both of them. And I think within, within that space as well, we've been talking a lot about carbon, and, and that's right, because that seems to be in everybody's mind, but sustainability is much more than carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, sustainability is about SDGs uh, and if you think about SDGs you cannot pick and choose because that's precisely what the SDGs do not want to do. So we need to think, of it. we've been talking about collaborative approaches, we need to think holistically everything that defines sustainability with carbon being quite a lot in front of our minds but there are many other things and, and we can see some of the technologies that James has been describing, do we know whether they're going to have an impact on water stress? Are they going to be taking resources from something else? Are we talking about minerals that are actually just going to change the geopolitics? We are going to be moving from fossil fuel geopolitics to maybe some precious metals geopolitics. So, so again, and, and how is that going to affect in growth? And, and I really like that there was this slide about planetary boundaries, because I really think it's really important, again, we reflect on planetary boundaries when we grow. It's not just about GDPs. Anyway, so I hope that was useful in terms of thinking holistically. Absolutely. I think you mentioned uh, the twin words, space and scale, and uh, we love it. Uh, we know some countries who say uh, net zero is a mandate, 
uh, and we know uh, others who say net zero is a commitment. So I keep questioning these words, commitment and mandate. And uh, we are also, I think, uh, living in a, we're fortunate to be living in a world which is connected. Uh, we know what is happening in the other part of the world sooner than uh, we, we, we were supposed to, uh, you know, even some, uh, know even sometimes. And uh, I think 10 years back, this was uh, uh, not available to us. Uh, I think that sort of uh, uh, brings me to an important thought that uh, it's important to share best practices across the world. Uh, we have seen this happening, uh, especially in uh, sectors uh, where uh, decarbonization is a big challenge. We have seen, for example, customers in the uh, 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 steel manufacturing space asking for proprietary technologies uh, which are coming up in other parts of the world. So we do that facilitation of uh, checking out uh, if this particular proprietary technology can be quickly scaled at a pace that requires to be met uh, from a net zero point of view in their own business goal and also the larger country uh, level goal that they have. We also understand that being connected comes with its own uh, uh, problems as well uh, because uh, you have a very complex supply chain. You have a company which is situated in UK sourcing its raw materials from Africa and South America and uh, it becomes extremely challenging to understand how this supply chain can be optimized. Uh, uh, that also brings us to the larger uh, decarbonization challenge in the supply chain uh, which we are working on because we have at least five components that we see is important uh, from a supply chain perspective. One is sourcing uh, the raw materials. Uh, they have to do it responsibly. Uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, logistics and distribution, which is the inbound and the outbound logistics, which is the materials coming into a factory and then materials leaving from the factory. You have the operation itself, which is the four walls of the manufacturing, which is part of the supply chain. That's the third one. And we have a fourth one, which is, again, a very important focus area for uh, many customers that we're seeing, which is packaging. A big uh, specialist specialization area by itself, a lot of innovation happening in packaging again. And the fifth one, which is last but not the least, is uh, how you can possibly uh, connect with your consumers, influence their behaviors to choose sustainable products. Uh, how can you make their life easier when it comes to choosing products and services which are more sustainable and possibly also pay a premium for it. You know, that's also something that is important as part of addressing the complex uh, global supply chain decarbonization issues. Uh, I would now like to throw open uh, 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 the questions to the audience. If you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll give you the mic. I think you raised first. Uh, this is an open question. Uh, if you see the IPCC report on climate change came almost two decades ago, the investments in technology have happened almost a decade ago, but to most this point, we are not seeing the scale and the pace of adoption in the industry at all. Is it because these technologies are not fit for scale and pace as of now? Is it because the industry as such doesn't know how to adopt these scale and uh, these technologies because they are still at a 50,000 feet? I mean, a retail client, I would say honestly, to uh, no disrespect to you, Han, is I don't care about carbon capture, right? Uh, I'm here running a retail chain. What do I do about it? How can I adopt the sustainability in my organization? Tell me that. Don't talk to me about the moon. Talk to me about what can I do next. Or is it that there is no price for non-performance on sustainability? Does that need to be there? I mean, your thoughts, please. Interesting question. <laughs> Who would like to take this? I, I can take the first stab if you want, <laughs> and then I'll quickly hand the mic to someone else. Someone else. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, all of the above, and I, and I really appreciate and respect your question there because it's got to be relevant and to you. Certainly what I see is I see a difference in geographies and regulations and policies What's happening and what's in, in EU law today is different to the US, is different to the rest of the world. So it's not a unified global view, but there are some promising things happening. Let me just give you one example, and hopefully this is going to be relevant for you. Right now in the US, under the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, this is where there are now government incentives for multiple industries to come together across different states to decarbonize and adopt and invest in technology, either that already exists but it isn't 
commercially available or do something for the greater good. And that, that's going to be a combination of energy industries, pharma, utilities, retail, anything that has a footprint, whether it's carbon or methane, whatever it is. Okay? The promising thing here is that, and I spoke a little bit about a few years ago, the transactional relationship, the way that an energy technology company would win work would be, or if we technically qualify, an on price. The criteria for awards for funding and projects now with this IAJA in the US, 20% of it is societal benefits. It's actually leveraged on job creation, impacting underserved communities, growing small businesses, reducing emissions. So it's a big shift. It's probably not where it needs to be globally, but I think once we see these demonstration projects take off, where we've got those proof points of different industries coming together, I think the rest of the world will follow. When you look to places like the Middle East, where you know UAE and Saudi, where highly leveraged with the international energy companies, so there's the money there, they can move at pace. There's different regulatory frameworks. So when you look at actually getting these projects off the ground, permitting and um, planning timeline, timelines, I think we're going to see a, a big uptake in the Middle East. But it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. But again, it's everything that we've talked about, it's, it's getting it relevant and having that shared goal. I can ask Please. So I, I think it's a, maybe an additional point to make. Um, so yes, one size doesn't fit all. I think as a consequence of that, we have created multiple solutions. And an unintended consequence of that is that we have created paralysis by analysis. Because we're just trying to find that perfect solution, right? That that's going to be the one with no regrets. So I know I just make a safe bet. And, and, and we hear these just coming all the way from SMEs, all the way from large corporates. So what we're trying to do with Hydric is really putting that in a framework that allows you to take the decisions today, because we cannot wait, it's that pace and scale, that allows you to take those decisions today with the low regrets. That doesn't mean it's going to be no regrets at all, but you know that you are taking a low regret decision, and then you can start moving with your company today. And, and that's sort of what we try to do with one stop shop, that actually it will help you to understand what technologies, what business models, what the skills or regulatory frameworks you need to have in place. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I think you can quickly introduce yourself before your question. I'll just give the mic sure. because the question is done. Uh, hi, I'm Santya here. I'm from DCA. Uh, I work in the business application practice. Thank you, Satya. Uh, I think the other point is also that, um, you know, uh, there's something called materiality analysis that we do as consultants when it comes to defining the sustainability priorities of every industry. That uh, actually takes care of what is uh, important for you as a company and also what is important for you to have the maximum uh, uh, branding and uh, benefits and also implications in terms of uh, how you can work with your larger ecosystem and stakeholders. What is material to you as a company when it comes to focusing on a particular sustainability imperative and every industry, be it retail or consumer goods or uh, discrete manufacturing company or an oil and gas company has to do that as part of the sustainability prioritization exercise. There was one more question. We have about a uh, couple of minutes. Introduce yourself. Hi. Uh, uh, this is Satish from TCS again. Uh, my question is, uh, we spoke about one of the best words, which is sustainability. Uh, just mostly looked at most of the organization today. Uh, the other equivalent buzzword which we see in the recent past is the artificial intelligence. Uh, not just artificial intelligence, but there are a lot of technology innovations that are coming up. Uh, but uh, those uh, technology innovation also needs, it's, it's more uh, resource intense and probably works uh, against the sustainability or it's not in line with the sustainability goals of the organization. So my question here is how the technology company has to look at balancing between these two. Any thoughts on that? Thanks, Satish. If I think I understand your question, how does AI apply to sustainability and how do we balance that within our organisations? So I think it represents a huge opportunity for us all, actually, the, the advances that we see with AI um, right now. And look, there's, there's all of the innovation that's going to come in terms of what that means, um, which is the exciting bit. But there are technologies now and, and AI that we're using now that can help with uh, sustainability challenges. We're doing some work with a company called Ocean Mind who are using AI to track illegal fishing uh, in the world so that they can stop that and, and make sure that, that that's, um, 
uh, you know, put in place. You can apply that to things like um, illegal trafficking of, of goods and, and um, biodiversity and, you know, uh, precious things coming through airports. Um, you can use it. We're working with a, an organisation called Conterra Systems, who are one of our um, that, uh, AI for sustainability startups that we've been working with last year, who are building a smart meter for the planet in terms of all the different aspects of um, you know, what they're tracking uh, across the world. So there's, there's brilliant opportunity, I think, for thinking about the great ideas that we need to gather data for and, and look at, uh, at patterns that can help us um, from a sustainability perspective. And you know, those organisations like Microsoft who are putting the investment in to ensure that that's done in, in the most sustainable way and obviously the back-end operations that we uh, build to ensure that that is sustainable is, is threaded through everything that we do. So I think we should see it as an exciting um, next step and, and th be thinking about the innovation that we can all apply into our organisations for those use cases where uh, AI can really help drive it forward. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jan, being part of the education business unit and passionate about sustainability. So yeah, the question is around what was asked earlier. We keep talking about technology, more computing, more computers, data centres, and you know all of those things which are energy in intensive. So what are we doing to track that part and where does it fit in the equation or in the data models or any other calculator that we are coming up with? I mean, how do we track that and how transparent are we with that? So yeah, anyway, thank you. Thanks, Janvi. I'm happy to. Happy to take that from a Microsoft perspective. So look, I think when we, um, a, a, a lot of the questions uh, when I'm out with uh, our customers will, 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 who are at the beginning of the journey will say, where's the best place to start with this? Because there's so many things to do. And I would always say, think about your operations. And how can you drive efficiencies through that? Now, one of the quick wins and the easy things to do from a data center perspective is look to get into the cloud. And there's still a lot of organizations who aren't in the cloud. Um, and so the efficiencies of doing that and on, on the Microsoft platform uh, onto Azure can be up to 95% more energy uh, efficient and um, ca um, uh, carbon efficient to do that because Microsoft are putting all of the efficiencies into driving the innovations around how we're doing that and how we're um, ensuring that our um, operations and our data centers are using you know, the, the most optimum form of energy uh, renewable energy, wh how we're reducing the water in, the, in terms of those operations, etc. So that would be uh, the first thing. And then when organisations are in the cloud, are on the Azure cloud, they can see through the impact emissions dashboard, which you get access to, exactly the, the, the footprint and, and impact that you have uh, running your operations in the cloud, so that, that you, know, you can see uh, the, there's a lot of um, organisations who are running um, you know, things that they don't need to and maybe can switch off or run more efficiencies in terms of how their, their operations are set up because they've got that view of what it takes to run it in the cloud. So um, I would say you know, that the, the, the focus that we bring at Microsoft to how to do that in the best possible way is central to, uh, as I say, not only what we're doing across uh, Microsoft ourselves, but how we pass that out and those um, efficiencies to our customers as well. Thank you so much, Mercy. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for your time, your patience. I know one of you have a flight to catch. <laughs> I don't want you to miss the flight. Uh, you've been very kind. And thanks, audience, as well, for those interesting questions. We will have this panel discussion uh, available as a webcast uh, in, a, in a few days uh, from now. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, I'll hand it over to Mike to uh, help us guide what is next. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very cheeky and ask one last question. 30 seconds. So we've heard a lot today about um, you know, the importance of carbon capture, the importance of an ecosystem, the importance of working together. We've got you know, quite a short time scale. But probably a question for you, James, as you're going through at the moment. When I step out of here today, tomorrow, where do I start? What do I do? OK. We often don't know what we don't know, right? I think we have to have the humility to, under, to, to accept that we can reach out and ask. And we don't, or no company has the, all the skill sets and trained people in their organization to do this. So have that humility to accept. There is no net zero 1.0 that's already been done and we're doing the net, this is new and that's okay. We have to be comfortable asking for help and guidance and working with a company like a Baker Hughes for the understanding the energy technology or TCS or Microsoft or different organizations like 
Mercedes is involved in. These organisations, yes, we've got a lot of in-house knowledge. I think we just have to accept that we can ask these like Baker Hughes, we ask people for help. We, we say we're partner agnostic. We, we, we will work with anyone if they can complement what we're doing and help for that common goal. So what do we do after this? We understand where we're currently at, identify the gaps, and think how we're going to fill them. Simple as that. Simple as that. Perfect. Thank you very much, panellists. A quick round of applause.